Good morning, happy Sabbath, everyone. It's great to see you all, and uh, I hope you had a good time during the Sabbath school lesson. And um, on the, I just want to encourage you to do some study uh, this afternoon. Um, take the the book, the Great Controversy, and on the topic of the judgment and the the day of judgment. You know that's a familiar term in the Old Testament, the Yom Kippur. I'd love for you to tell me what you think about the reading of the chapters of the Great Controversy in chapter 23 and chapter 24 and chapter 28. So 23, 24, and 28. Chapter 23 is what is the sanctuary? Very powerful biblical Um, exposition there of the Old Testament sanctuary and how that applies in the New Testament and how Jesus is right now our high priest and uh, that he is ministering in the most holy place right now since 1844. So that first chapter 23, what is the sanctuary? 24, in the holy of holies and 28, facing life's record or the investigative judgment. I had uh, a great time studying that as I was studying for the lesson. Uh, this week. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that you would fill our hearts and minds with your words and with your wisdom, that we would fulfill the prayer of Jesus, that we would be united together as you were united with the Father, that we would be united with Christ and that we would be one in Christ. Father in heaven, Jesus is coming soon, and the devil is working to destroy your church, to distract it, to divert it from its mission and its message. And so, Father, we pray for wisdom, and we pray that we would be united in the spirit and in the mind and in the power of Christ. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you get excited reading the Bible or if you had um, a time where you were reading the Bible this week and you really got excited and you couldn't put it down. Anybody ever had that experience? You get so excited you can't put it down. And you know how it gets really fun when you start cross-referencing and you start looking at the same topic in other parts of the scriptures. That's the most beneficial and um, profitable Bible study, friends. You know, we tend very often in the Christian world to quote one text here and one text there, but we need to study the whole of the context. Um, It's a bit like you receive a love letter from your fiancé or from your boyfriend or girlfriend or a note from your husband. You don't just read, you know, one line and close it and say, well, I've got it all, do you? You read it all and you want to know what every single detail and then you want to read it again to make sure that you got all the details. That's how we need to to read the scriptures. So very often, you know, we come across hard topics or hard um, passages. I encourage you, just start from the beginning of the book, seriously, and read through. And uh, I, I did this exercise with the, the book of First Corinthians. And you know, there's a lot in the book of First Corinthians that I, that I haven't understood and I didn't understand. But guess what? I've been understanding more. Passages that were kind of blank, found that as I would read through chapters 1, 2, 3, and then read through again chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 5, and, and read them, and read them, suddenly the, the theme and the, the thread became clear to me, where it wasn't clear at first. Do, do you know what I'm talking about? This is the way we need to study the Scriptures, friends. And when I stumbled across such a powerful statement as we find there, at um, the end of chapter 2 in Corinthians. Powerful, powerful statement where it, it says, and it kind of helped me understand why sometimes we understand things and sometimes we don't, and why sometimes we see people that don't understand things of the Bible and why they don't understand things of the Bible. Verse 14, our scripture reading. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because they are foolishness to him. 
Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. What does that tell us? To understand the things of God, we need the Holy Spirit to help us understand. And the natural man who doesn't accept God, doesn't receive the Spirit of God, cannot understand them, cannot see them, because he needs the Holy Spirit to understand them. And so a Christian to a non-believer looks like a fool. And the things that he says are foolishness to him. But then it says, verse 15, but he that is spiritual, and, and from my reading I understand the one that is truly a born-again Christian and has the Holy Spirit living within them. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. You know, if non-believers judge us and think we're crazy, well, that's their problem. They haven't got the Holy Spirit to understand. But then that statement but we have the mind of Christ. As Christians, I challenge you to ask God to help you understand that we have the mind of Christ. That's a powerful thing, isn't it? And it's interesting because this is the key to unity amongst Christians. It's the key to wisdom. And in, in our uh, call to worship, we, um, we came across that. I mean, Paul goes through this amazing statement. Could, did you see that? Where he says in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 1, and he says, verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Is that weird or what? Speak the same thing? That there be no divisions among you. That you be perfectly joined together in the what? In the same mind. Whose mind? In Christ's mind. Now the problem with Corinthians was that everybody was saying, you know what, I'm just following Paul. I'm only going to listen to the preaching of Paul. And some, another, another group got together and they said, we're just going to follow what Peter says. And another group got together and said, well, you know what, Apollos is a great preacher. We're just going to listen to him. And so Paul reminds these believers that they are to be in unity and not be doing what the Greeks would be doing in their way of estimating the wisdom of the world and elevating people above Christ. And so Paul says, was, was Paul um, crucified for you? Is Christ divided? Of course not. And so the whole, then, then Paul goes into an amazing argument about wisdom. And the, he contrasts, there's two kinds of wisdom. And I thought, this is amazing. It's so basic. There's only two kinds of wisdom. You and I will only adhere to and follow only one of two kinds of wisdom. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? And Paul tells us that there are two kinds. And um, let's just, just look at this very, very briefly. And I encourage you to read this at home for yourselves. Um, in chapter 1, he, he's, he's uh, greeting the church and he gives them uh, the encouragement as believers, what they should be and how they should be experiencing. Chapter 1, verse 5, that in everything you are enriched by him, in all utterance and knowledge. As believers, we are to have in Christ all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Don't have time to get into the testimony of Christ, but what Christ does in the human being in making us like Jesus Christ is a testimony of Christ. The testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come short. Notice that. In no gift, no gift will be lacking in God's true church as we wait for the coming of Jesus Christ. You know what? Guess what? That includes the spirit of prophecy. Did you catch that? You see, you have to be very attentive when you're reading the Holy Scriptures. Also, um, who shall also confirm you. So Jesus will confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless when Jesus comes at the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. Who is faithful? God is faithful, by whom you are called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ. So we're called into the fellowship of Jesus Christ. And as we fellowship with Jesus Christ, we fellowship with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. And we have the mind of Christ. And then Paul says, why are you divided? Why are you bickering amongst yourselves? Why are you saying, well, I'm only following this theologian? Another group says, I'm following that theologian. 
You're foolish. You're not being united as Christ has called us to be. And then he says, look, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not in the wisdom of words. Now here's a phrase that kind of uh, uh, gets our attention. The wisdom of words. Whose words? Well, he'll explain it. Lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Because the cross of Christ is so powerful, man's wisdom will take away its power. Do you know when Jesus said, you invalidate the word of God? God's word is valid. God's word is powerful. But he said to the Pharisees, you invalidate. That means you take away the power of the word of God. By what did he say? How did, did Jesus say that those Pharisees invalidated, took away the power of the word of God? By what? By what? By your tradition. By your man-made ideas. Man-made philosophy. Man-made wisdom. So Paul is contrasting this and he says that I didn't preach to you the, the, the gospel with man's wisdom. You know, in debate and arguing. And, you know, you only listen to me if I've got a PhD. That's what the world does, right? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish. Foolishness. But unto us which are saved. Are you saved by the blood of Jesus Christ? The Word of God says that we are saved. That the preaching of the cross is foolishness to, to them that perish, but to us that are saved, it is the power of God. Salvation is powerful, friends. We need power, don't we, to change our sinful ways. We can't do it in ourselves. So often people say, well, you know, Pastor, I'll get baptized once I give up this, that, that, and the other. Are you trying to get perfect in your own strength? There's something wrong there. And so often, yes, it's true, we cannot bring people into the fellowship of the, the body of Christ until they have shown that, yes, they are walking in harmony with Christ. But we cannot think, or we should not think, that we can correct our own sinfulness by ourselves and then we come to Jesus because now I'm all cleaned up, now I can get baptized. Can you see the, the thinking somehow there is getting skewed? There is power in the preaching of the cross. It is the power of God. And you see, Paul goes on to, to talk about the wisdom that was prevalent of, in the day. Let me just ask you, what was the wisdom that was prevalent in the day of, of, uh, of Jesus and of Paul and of the apostles. What was the learning of the day? Where did it come from? Yeah, I heard somebody say it. The Greeks. The Greeks. Now, now, if you just think about that, think of who? Greek philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, and all of these. They had amazing kind of wisdom, didn't they? And the Bible says that we must have the wisdom that is of God because there is a wisdom that is of the world, and actually it is from the devil. And so we must have the mind of Christ so that we can have the wisdom of God. But guess what? Guess whose mind is behind the wisdom of the world? Jesus said, for it is written, verse 19, I will destroy the wisdom of the, of the wise, the worldly wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? You know, a scribe was a learned man, scholarly person. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? And you might put there, debater of this world. Has not God made the foolishness, or has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Can you see that? There is a wisdom that is of the world. And God in his wisdom, he goes on to say in verse 21, for after that, in the wisdom of God, so God's wisdom is that the world, by its own wisdom, would not know God. You cannot find God through the wisdom of the world, through debate, through argument. We will only find God with the aid of who? The help of the Holy Spirit. How many of you want to be wise today? How many of you want the wisdom of God as opposed to the wisdom of the world? Amen. You see... It pleased God by the foolishness to the world of the preaching of the cross to save those that believe. So we must believe and we will receive the wisdom of God. For the Jews require a sign. The Jews 
want to say, Jesus, show us. And what are they doing when the Jews come along and say to Jesus, if you want us to believe you are who you say you are, um, show us a sign. What are they doing? You know what they're doing? They are saying that we will only accept you if you conform to our ideas of who you should be. Have you ever had that happen in the Christian church? Oh, we don't listen to him because he doesn't say things the way we want them to be told. That's one way of looking at it. And there is the, the other aspect of that is that there is a sign. Show me, demonstrate, prove. Scientific observation, you know. Prove it. Prove it the way I'm telling you, you must prove it. Just like the devil came to Jesus and said, if you are the Son of God, prove it to me the way I'm telling you, I want you to prove that to me. That's the wisdom of the world. So, for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Now, you could carry on and read the rest of chapter 1 to chapter 2. And um, it's, it's really an amazing, an amazing explanation about these two contrasting wisdoms and where they come from. Excellency of speech, um, the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of the princes of this world. Those are phrases that Paul uses. And... We, we can see then that we are not to use that kind of wisdom. We are to have the power of God. We are to have the Spirit of God. Not the Spirit of this world, chapter 2, verse 12. And you know, this is really why so many people don't understand the Scriptures. They're not willing to humble themselves to the Spirit of God to, to open their minds and so it says, as we read in chapter 2, verse 14, the natural man, the unaided man that doesn't have the Holy Spirit cannot see the things of God because they need to be discerned and we need the help of God through His Holy Spirit to understand them. You know, sometimes I come to the Scriptures and my mind is a blank. I, 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 I'm missing understanding. But so often, if I pray, and when I pray, and when I ask God, please help me to understand, something happens in my mind. Have you ever had that happen too? I encourage you to read the Bible until something happens in your mind where suddenly you can see things clearly. And it's amazing how we must be in earnest and in, sin in sincerity coming to the Word of God. And we who are weak in the so-called world's wisdom, we don't have PhDs or, or degrees like learned men. And see, this is what the Greeks did. You, you were only listened to, get that, you weren't nobody in the realm of sharing of any wisdom unless you had a doctorate. And so the Christians were falling into the trap of doing what the human wisdom was doing of the day and elevating men and so they, they would stop listening to, to the word of God because they wanted to listen to man instead and, and so Paul was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, stop doing that. Say the same thing. Speak the same thing. Don't let there be divisions among you. Seek every one of you to have the mind of Christ. And then we will be united. Amen? You know, it's um, amazing what the debaters can do. You know, so have you ever been in an argument with somebody? Maybe about some point of faith. And you explain it, you know, this way and that way, and you come at it at a different angle. You may be trying to explain about the Sabbath or the state of the dead. And sometimes, or often it can be the case that it just doesn't get through. Folks don't understand it. You've explained it. You've shown the, the, the text that prove it. But you remember what Jesus said, you invalidate the word of God by your tradition. There's a tradition that holds that when you die, you don't die. So people, when you even try and show them the truth of God's word, that their mind is blinded 
to that truth because they hold on to the tradition. You know, it takes something more than just you and I arguing with somebody and showing texts. It takes power, and for that we must pray. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit. It takes you being humble. You know what? The devil will draw you into an argument until you get angry. And then when you've got angry, guess who won? The devil did. Because you lose your cool, you get frustrated, and you say, well, I've had it with you. You're so useless, you can't even understand a simple thing. And then they look at you and say, well, I thought you said you had the truth. Well, you don't look very sweet and truthful to me. Can you see what the devil can do? We can get into debates and arguments and thinking that if we just show them the text, wham, 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 wallop, there you go, down and out. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit that we would have the mind and the wisdom of Christ. i um, got a, an illustration here. Once when a stubborn disputer seemed unconvinced, Lincoln, this is Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln said, well, you know, frustrated because he couldn't get his point across. So he says, well, let's see um, how many legs has a cow. So the guy who's arguing with says, four, of course, came the reply disgustedly. That's right, said Lincoln, and he agreed. Now suppose that you call the cow's tail a leg. How many legs does the cow have now? And then he retorted and said, why five, of course, was the confident reply. Now that's where you're wrong, says Lincoln. Calling a cow's tail a leg does not make it a leg. And so you can, you know, with human reason and debating, get frustrated, but it takes power to convince people out of the, the wisdom of the world. And you know, you've heard of uh, many arguments like, oh, well, it doesn't matter what religion you belong to, um, you'll all get saved in the end, right? What does the Bible say? No other name given amongst men whereby we must be saved. That's not bigotry. That's not being exclusive. That's being inclusive. Because everyone who believes on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be saved. But the devil is polluting the minds of his believers with these false teachings, with these traditions that prevent people from seeing the Word of God. Be careful what you hold on to as a tradition. You know, worldliness is what we're up against. The Bible defines worldliness. You see, worldly wisdom. Worldliness by centering a morality where it intuitively where it intuitively knows it should be worldliness is the lust of the flesh a passion for sensual satisfaction the lust of the eyes an inordinate desire for the finer things of life this life that is this world and the pride of life that's world in worldliness self-satisfaction in who we are what we have and what we have done worldliness then is a preoccupation with ease and affluence do you know anybody that lives like that? I pray it's not me. I pray it's not you. That's the worldly wisdom. It elevates the creature comfort to the point of idolatry. Large salaries, comfortable lifestyles become necessities of life. Worldliness is reading magazines about people who live hedonistic lives and spend too much money on themselves and wanting to be like them. But more importantly, worldliness is simply this, pride and selfishness in disguise. It's being resentful when someone snubs you or patronizes us or shows off in front of us. It means smarting under every slight, challenging every word spoken against us, cringing when another is preferred before us. Worldliness is harboring grudges, nursing grievance, and wallowing in self-pity. These are the ways which we are most like the world. Christianity. You know, Christians today claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. I came across this addressing a national seminar of Southern Baptist leaders, George Gallup. You know George Gallup? He's the one that makes all the, the surveys and, and uh, statistics. He said, we find that there is very little difference in ethical behavior between churchgoers and those who are not actively re religious. Very little difference. The levels of lying, cheating, stealing are remarkably similar in both groups, believers and non-believers. 
Eight out of ten Americans consider themselves Christians, Gallup said. Yet only about half of them could identify the person who gave the Sermon on the Mount, and fewer still could recall five of the Ten Commandments. Only two in ten said that they would be willing to suffer for their faith. So you can see how the wisdom of the world is diminishing the strength of the church. But you know, the course of rebellion against God may be very, very gradual. But it increases like a snowball. Friends, we need the mind of Christ more than anything else. Amen? But we need to be careful what we allow to come into our minds, into our homes, and into our church. Some years ago, some mus musicians noted that um, errand boys that were going around their errands in the city of London were all whistling out of tune as they went about their work. It was talked about at length, and someone suggested that it was because the bells of Westminster Abbey were sounding slightly out of tune. Something had gone wrong, and the chimes were now giving out discordant tones, and the boys didn't know there was anything wrong. Could it be that we don't know that the world is truly out of tune? The boys didn't know that there was anything wrong with the, the bells and were unconscious, unconsciously copying their pitch. So we tend to copy the people whom we associate with or listen to or borrow thoughts from the books we read or the TV programs that we watch almost without knowing it. But God has given us His incorruptible Word which is the absolute pitch of life and of living. If we are learning to sing by the Word of God, we shall easily detect the false music in the world. But we have the mind of Christ. Amen.